So navigating the often challenging waters of perimenopause can be a daunting journey, but it doesn't have to be. So like puberty during the teenage years, which is very awkward, here we are again. Um, perimenopause can fall in that same category of awkwardness because we're not really sure what's happening with our bodies. Something that's happening with one of your friends may not be happening with you, or you may be experiencing the gamut of things and just trying to figure things out so that you're not going to be in limbo long term. Um, I've taken care of women as young as 37 with hot flashes, nights, 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 the midsection weight gain. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit of an echo. Anybody else? Oh, you froze just a little bit, I think. Did okay. I too? All right. I think we're okay. I had a little bit of an echo. one frozen? But anyway, okay. but anyway so there's also people well into their 60s that are fearing that they're never going to sleep again, um, which is heart-wrenching because we know how important things like sleep is. But also my own background led me down the path of not only studying, but pursuing natural health care. Um, hello, by the way, I'm Dr. Michelle Doherty of Lifetime Health and Wellness in Naperville. And we're dedicated to elevating quality of life for women and kids through chiropractic care, no matter what their unique life journey is. And we just really want to inspire just you feeling empowered enough to make the best decision for yourself and to always be looking and never settle for anything less than that, because we have one life, we deserve to be happy and healthy, and we just want to best support you in that way. So for tonight, we're looking to not only just give you information, but just know that this is really a time of celebration. And with World Menopause Day, in case you didn't know that, cheers to that. Um, I've got tea here. This is like stress relieving tea. Um, anyway, I just really want to open up your perspectives, just allow you to be open and go on this journey with us as we explore more natural approaches. So just a couple quick housekeeping tips here, what you can expect from tonight. We're going to be defining the different phases of perimenopause and menopause, as well as the roles of estrogen and progesterone how hormones affect you from your brain all the way down to your vagina, how to get your ducks in a row and reverse engineer what you want from this phase in life, how technology can help bridge the gap of where you are now and where you can be. And then finally, we're going to have a couple lucky winners um, who stay on till the end. And we will draw that at the end after I stop recording. All right, take it away, Carrie. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Carrie. Sure. I'm a women's health physical therapist. So that means in addition to treating things like back pain, hip pain, neck pain, knee pain, I specialize in more intimate diagnoses, things like pain with intercourse, urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, and then a wide variety of pregnancy, postpartum, and perimenopausal symptoms. And everything that I've achieved in my career has come from a desire to fix a personal problem that I had and was fueled by the realization that we as women are cyclical beings living in a linear world. And I first noticed this in pregnancy with the lack of education. So I became a prenatal Pilates specialist and did a six week class that was a combination for education and exercise. And then I noticed my postpartum patients were feeling forgotten by the medical community. So I took some other certifications so I could serve those women. And then interestingly enough, when my daughter was in fifth grade, she took the puberty class in fifth grade. For those of you with young kids, that's when this district around here usually decides to educate our girls about their bodies. And most of their bodies have already begun to have some of those changes. So they're already confused. So we kind of missed the mark a little bit in the timing of when we do it. But her education consisted of listening to a set of headphones where it was like a 30 minute presentation that went over maybe like pubic hair and body odor. It was given by the school nurse, uh, the health teacher, the gym teacher, the janitor for all I know. And the only thing she learned is that if you laugh, you would be taken to the principal's office. Well, laughing is a coping mechanism for topics that are awkward and uncomfortable. And in fifth grade, learning about your body is awkward and uncomfortable. 
So as I was lamenting the state of puberty and sex education, I decided I'd become a puberty educator and I hired a period coach. Yes, there is such a thing. And I developed mom and me menstruation workshops about five years ago. And then those moms begged me to do mom and son puberty workshops, which I did about two years ago. And last year I taught comprehensive sex ed to students in fifth through 12th grade. So that was an interesting little side journey for me. But what I realized as a midlife woman is that perimenopause, which I'm in right now, is abs absolutely the reverse of puberty and even less talked about. So I became a third age woman specialist. I think that's just a nice way of saying specializing in the older woman. They're calling us third age women. So that was kind of nice. And it's a peri to postmenopause wellness coaching program. And I've learned a lot in those classes. And what I'm hoping to do for you tonight is simplify the science just a little bit. And definitely stay tuned till the end. Because like Dr. Michelle said, we have a little giveaway to give you. And what I'm really hoping is to give you some tangible, actionable steps tonight so that you can enter the second half of your life with a little bit more grace and ease because most like half the population will go through menopause and most of us will spend over three decades as postmenopausal women. So we deserve to know what's happening with our body. So this is a good time to introduce what perimenopause even is. Perimenopause is the term for the two to 10 years before you will get your final menstrual period. And there's usually a fairly predictable sequence of hormonal events that happen in those two to 10 years, mainly involving estrogen and progesterone. We have a couple different phases. And if you want to know what phase you're in, this should help you out. So if we talk about early perimenopause, this means your periods and your cycles are still very regular, but you're starting to notice some symptoms. And I'll list off those symptoms in a second. If you are in the early menopause transition, that means that your cycles are starting to get irregular and the average age for this is about 48 years of age. And then we have the late menopause transition. And in this phase, you will have your first cycle that's longer than 60 days, which means two missed periods. And then finally, we enter the late perimenopause transition. And this is the two to 12, sorry, yes, the two to 12 months after your final menstrual period. Menopause itself is literally one day on the calendar. 12 months after you had your last period, you can mark the day, and the average age in the United States is 51 years of age. But if you haven't had a period for six months and you get a period, you start all the way back at ground zero because you need 12 consecutive months with no period to say you're officially in menopause. That's one day. And then after that, you're in post-menopause. So just so we know what the terms are, I think that makes it a little more easier to explain. So how do you know if you're in perimenopause? You might have heard friends saying, oh, I'm getting my hormones tested. And you wonder, should I be getting my hormones tested to see where I am? The general rule of thumb is that if you're 45 years and older and still cycling regularly, that getting your hormones tested isn't super reliable because your hormones fluctuate on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes an hour-to-hour -hour basis. Same thing if you're between 40 and 45. It's better to diagnose and treat you based on your symptoms rather than on any sort of hormone testing. If you're less than 40 and noticing changes in your cycle, this is a chance where maybe the hormone testing would be helpful, but regardless of the stage you're at, we should all be going for annual blood work that's looking at things like thyroid testing, lipid panels, liver panels, testing vitamins like vitamin D3, B12, looking at things like iron and ferritin. That's all helpful information for all of us. Now, if we're not testing hormones, what symptoms are we looking for? According to Dr. Gerilyn Pryor, who's a famous endocrinologist, if you have any three of the following nine symptoms I'm going to read off, chances are you are in perimenopause. Number one, heavier periods. Number two, worsened period pain. Number three, shorter at first menstrual cycles, so less than every 26 days. Painful, lumpy breasts. Difficulty sleeping or mid-sleep waking, premenstrual night sweats, new or increased premenstrual mood swings, new or markedly increased migraine headaches, and weight gain without changes in exercise or eating. 
So think about those in your head. Those were nine symptoms. She says, if you have any three of those nine, you're probably in perimenopause. And if you notice a lot of those symptoms had to do with your period. And in order to understand why your period is changing, we have to have a quick conversation about estrogen and progesterone. I want you to think about estrogen like the fertilizer that makes the lining of the uterus grow nice and thick and fluffy. And progesterone is almost like the lawnmower that comes through and keeps that growth in check. So estrogen is actually quite easy for your body to make. We have a spike in estrogen right before we ovulate, and then we make it again later on in the cycle. Progesterone is pretty tricky for the body to make, and it's mainly made only during ovulation. And ovulation is kind of hard for the body to do. So in the very beginning, when you first started getting your period as a younger menstruator, what happened is estrogen was made very readily. So you had a plump lining of your uterus, but progesterone and ovulation were a little harder to do. Sometimes took up to two years for your body to figure that out. So you didn't have the lawnmower. So it was maybe that you had pretty heavy periods for the first two years. And if you don't remember yourself, some of you might have young daughters that are at this stage and it's quite normal to have heavy periods for those first two years of menstruating because of the estrogen being unbalanced by the progesterone. Now, fast forward to perimenopause, which is actually the reverse of puberty. And what's happening is that your ovaries hang a going out of business sign in the window, and they enter a semi-retired state where they're making less ripe eggs. And they're not ovulating every month. So we again have a situation where we have estrogen the fertilizer and not as much progesterone, the lawnmower. So once again, we can experience heavier periods with that somewhat estrogen excess, if you will. Um, eventually estrogen does decline just like progesterone, but it's a bossy hormone. It doesn't go out without a fight. And a lot of the symptoms that we can experience in this perimenopausal time are because of this imbalance in estrogen and progesterone. Just like in puberty, your brain is rewiring in perimenopause. And so Dr. Michelle is gonna talk a little bit about how some of these hormonal changes affect the brain and then trickle down to other parts of the body. All right. So how hormones or the lack thereof can affect your brain and your body. Let's start up in the brain. We have estrogen receptors up there in the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, which basically is responsible for your cognition and your memory. So when you feel like you're getting stupid, this is probably part of the reason why. Because if, if, for example, if you are inundated with a lot of stress, you have cortisol receptors too. So they start to compete and you have more stress hormone flooding your brain that it starts interfering with us being able to have common recall. Where did I leave my keys? I'm walking around with the glasses on my head, you know, things like that. Um, also with less progesterone circulating sleep can be more difficult, whether it's falling asleep or staying asleep. If our reserves are tapped out by this stage of midlife, whether we've had a notable crisis or we've had constant, just constant stressors going on between kids, significant other work finances, socially, what have you. Um, you're not going to have anything left over in, in the tank. And every single day, your body is allotted a certain amount of energy for basic life functions, which is going to take the precedence over everything. So when it comes to, you know, having energy to work out or stamina to do certain things, um, and then not to mention libido, sex and libido, I mean, forget it, that's already out the window. It's one of the first things to go away and one of the last things to return when we don't have those reserves. Um, later on, we're going to talk about how you can look at energy reserves to be able to heal, to adapt, um, and ultimately thrive. Hot flashes and night sweats, they can occur when our backup system, our adrenal glands, they're about the shape of a walnut, they sit on top of the kidneys, they secrete up to 50 different hormones in our body, and it regulates everything from energy, metabolism, um, sex hormone production. I mean, it has its hand in a lot of stuff. So our backup system, those glands, 
they will manufacture progesterone and estrogen to a lesser extent than what the ovaries did. In fact, when you're a cycling woman in the first half up until ovulation, your adrenals are making progesterone just at a much lower amount. And then once you ovulate, that area takes over. So you can imagine when that area starts to wean, your backup system, not only does it have to make stress hormones all month long, but now it's having to make sex hormones all month long. So we have to make sure that we're entering this stage strong. And if not, there's still ways to boost that up. So I wanted to, to point those things out, but also knowing that the hormones that function together will also dysfunction together. Your adrenal glands and your thyroid gland They're like BFFs. As one is going one way, the other will follow. So if we have adrenals that are tapped out, our thyroid could possibly slow down. And we know the thyroid's important when it comes to not just metabolism, but also body temperature regulation. So um, I know Carrie is going to go into the lower half and how it's going to be affecting muscles, vaginal tissue, bones, and so on. Well, let's just dive right into the vagina. Now, shall we? We all own uh, one of those and we are going from the brain all the way to the vagina here. And there are a ton of estrogen receptors in your vagina. So with the loss of estrogen that occurs in the later part of the perimenopause transition, what ends up happening is that our vaginas can become drier, thinner, and less elastic. In fact, there's a whole category of symptoms that get its own name, the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, that really refers to all of this going on, which means sex can be maybe more painful when it wasn't painful before. Things can be drier in the vaginal area when maybe they weren't drier before. And because your bladder is in such close proximity to the walls of the vagina, you're gonna start to notice potentially some bladder problems as well. Maybe more frequent urinary tract infections, um, maybe a little extra urinary incontinence or loss of urine. Now, this isn't everybody. Like Dr. Michelle was saying, you, you have to think about perimenopause as a brain rewiring, almost like you're going to give your phone a software update. Some people are going to sail through with no glitches at all. Some of us might have a few glitches. We go to log back onto our phone, an app has moved over here, something is hard to find, something got rearranged. And unfortunately, some of us are going to have a lot of glitches. So we want to prepare you for things that might happen, not scare you because some people have very little to no symptoms at all. So when we talk about um, vaginal symptoms and those genital urinary symptoms of menopause, we're going to talk about some solutions in just a second. But I also want to talk about estrogen receptors in your muscles and your bones. You will lose 6% of your bone in the one year before menopause in the two years after. Within five to seven years of reaching menopause, you will lose 20% of your bone mass and you will continue to lose bone at a rate of 0.5 to 1.5% each year. So that means when we get to the exercise section, that's gonna become pretty important, what we're choosing to do to combat that. Your muscles also have receptors in the muscles. And so when you lose estrogen, your body's main form of estrogen and later perimenopause, what ends up happening is you are experiencing more cell death, which means your muscles can get weaker, it can be hard to generate strength, and it'll be harder to recover from injury. Your heart is a muscle too. And prior to menopause, you have a much lower risk than an average man when it comes to heart disease. But once we lose our body's main form of estrogen and within about 10 years of being in menopause, you will have a risk similar to a man's risk. And I think women don't quite understand the large risk for heart disease that there is. It's the number one killer of women. One in four women will die of heart disease versus only one in eight when it comes to breast cancer. And while this seems very doom and gloom, the good news is that by adopting a healthy lifestyle, you can cut your risk by 80%, which is huge. So we'll get to the lifestyle things um, in a little bit. I want to mention quickly something I hear complained about from my clients all the time, probably because I am a body worker. But it's this weight gain, this unexplained weight gain, usually around the middle. And hey, I'm no stranger to this either. I have watched as my once athletic build has plumped, softened, shifted, 
I'm abandoning piles of bras that don't clasp in the back anymore. I am trading in my skinny jeans for elastic waistline, waistlines. And this is despite any changes in my diet or exercise. And I'm finding myself for the first time looking in the mirror, saying for the love of all things, holy, what is happening? What is happening here? So let's go through some of the things that could be responsible for a change in your body shape. Number one, we just talked about having a decreased muscle mass. And when that happens, that will lower your metabolism just a little bit. Also decreased estrogen causes the liver to make less sex hormone binding globulin, which means you have more androgens floating around, mostly testosterone. And as a result of that, you can notice changes in your cholesterol and you can notice an increased visceral fat gain. And you can notice unwanted hair growth. Hello, chin hairs in the rear view mirror. We are seeing you. You can also have insulin resistance. So what happens is when you lose estrogen, you lose your body's ability to pull uh, sugar from the blood into the cells. So your body will secrete more insulin, but it's almost too much and the body isn't ready for this. So you become almost insulin resistant, which means now you have more circulating blood sugar, which can then get stored as fat, which you know we're not looking for. Also, when you're overweight, you have increased leptin hormone. That's the I'm full hormone. And you would think that's a good thing. The problem is you have so much, the body almost doesn't register it. So you're not getting those signals that you're full. And as Dr. Mich Michelle did such a great job of mentioning when it comes to your adrenals and stress, when you're faced with stress, cortisol stimulates um, the release of fat and carbs into your system, which means now you have more glucose. Now you can become a little more insulin resistant. And cortisol does a terrible job distinguishing between a true life emergency and a minor life inconvenience, like your purse strap getting stuck on the door handle as you're flying out the door. It doesn't know the difference. So if that happens and we're, we've trained our body so much to be on high alert, that means you're getting a steady stream of cortisol into the bloodstream which means your blood sugar is elevated. And what your body does is it stores that fat in a very helpful location right in the middle because it wants it to be ready for the liver to metabolize and break down into energy in case you need to have another life emergency. And we've unfortunately trained our body that the next life emergency might be right around the corner. The other thing we already talked about was you have decreased muscle mass. And so um, you are more prone to injury. Plus, if you're already having some pelvic floor leakage, these are two things that might discourage people from doing the regular exercise, which can contribute to weight gain as well. What I will say is as midlife women, we need to break up with our scales and fall in love with our tape measures because measuring a waist to hip ratio is a far more reliable way to get an idea of your general health. So you would use a soft tape measure to measure the narrowest part of your waist, and then the largest part of your hips, you would divide the waist by the hip measurement, and that would give you your waist to hip ratio. 0 0.8 and below is ideal. That means a low health risk. Anything between 0 0.8 and 0 0.85 is a moderate health risk. And anything over 0 0.85 means a more serious health risk. So on that doomy gloomy note, um, I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Michelle, who's going to talk about things that we can do almost like a call to action to help us start getting ready to enter this phase of life with all of our ducks in a row. Yes. I'm going to start right off with sleep, which I'll be doing right after this wraps up. Um, sleep is one of these underrated things that, you know, when we're a kid, we want to stay up. And when we're adults, we just want to go back to bed. Uh, when it comes to sleep hygiene, unless you're sleeping seven to eight hours per night, you're really not doing your body any favors. A lack of sleep or sleeping at the wrong time can actually be one of the worst habits for people, um, and it really disrupts hormone balance. Why? Because hormones work on a schedule, and case in point, cortisol, that stress hormone it's regulated at midnight. So if we get to bed late at night, we never truly get a break from that sympathetic fight or flight response, which has led to widespread stress-related health disorders in our country. So to maximize hormone function, aim to get to bed at by 10 p.m. 
endocrinologists claim that one hour, one hour of sleep between the hours of 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. is equal to two hours of sleep before or after these times. Um, so make sure that your room is pitch black. That means if you need to put something over the alarm clock or if you're getting um, lights coming in through the blinds, we can all sit in the rooms that we're at. If we close our eyes, your pineal gland still knows that there's light, which means you're not going to get the full amount of melatonin production needed to help you fall asleep. Um, and then some people would, you know, go on to say, well, why not just supplement with like melatonin? Well, it can be tricky because anytime you supplement with a hormone, the very gland that is there to secrete that will decide to go on vacation and they're not going to step up to the plate, you know, when you need it. So it's always good if you can help support the gland, especially if you have it so that it can do what it needs at the right time. Um, what did I want to say here? Um, aside from the room, uh, temperature regulation. So ideally we want to be at about 65 degrees Fahrenheit. For those of you who are experiencing hot flashes and night sweats, I mean, we know if it's too hot, we're just, it's not going to be good REM sleep. It's awful. But then you may have a partner that maybe likes it warmer or cooler. Well, you know what? They can layer up, they can take the sheet. I mean, there are ways to do this, but ideally you need coolness, darkness, those are going to be keys. Um, another great thing is a protein fat-based snack before bedtime. So that can do two things. One of the examples is like a handful of nuts or a spoonful of peanut butter, as long as you don't have those allergies. Those are great because nuts in particular, they contain tryptophan, which leads to melatonin and serotonin production. So we can sleep in the same breath, protein fat-based snacks they tend to keep blood sugar stabilized longer throughout the night because when we have these blips, these um, spikes in blood sugar, that can actually wake you up. So it's not a great idea to have like heavy desserts and a lot of carbs at night because things don't stay steady. So that is um, a great tactical thing that you can already start with. Magnesium is one of those things where even at our house, we have the powdered magnesium called natural calm um, that we'll sometimes use. So whether it's me, my husband or my son, um, what magnesium does, it's known as the chill out mineral. So a lot of athletes will do Epsom soaks, you know, and that helps to relax the muscles and the tissues. But it's very handy if you're still a menstruating woman, especially when it comes to cramps, headaches, anxiety, um, those types of things, sleeplessness. It's really like one of these wonder minerals. So it's a great one for that. Um, and guess what fun treat is loaded with magnesium? Dark chocolate. chocolate. Yes, dark chocolate. Ideally, 70% or higher. Um, it's no wonder we crave chocolate around our cycles, but unfortunately, if we're grabbing for like a Snickers or, you know, these milk chocolate, it's just full of sugar and it's not going to be the same thing. You would have to eat like a ton of it. And that's actually what happens. Once you eat a bite, you just can't stop dark chocolate, especially in those higher percentages, like a square is enough, like you feel satiated, it feels good. And it's usually enough. So that's one of my favorites. And then there's, you know, these sleepy time teas and supplements out there. Like a lot of the components will be these herbs like chamomile, valerian root, hops, things like that. Uh, nutrition wise, I just wanted to, because I, I felt like I needed to talk a lot about, about sleep because it's, it's so, so important. Uh, but nutrition wise, Carrie had mentioned vitamin D. Vitamin D3 in particular is going to be the usable form for the body. So it's not having to jump through different hoops, especially if you're taking a vitamin D2, your body has to expend more energy to convert that to a usable form. But D, vitamin D is actually a steroid hormone and it controls the production of estrogen and progesterone to keep them balanced. Um, it can help with low mood, especially in the winter. And if you guys, you know, you live in the Chicagoland area, you know, between basically Labor Day to Memorial Day, 
we're, you know, we're kind of in the dark a little bit more. It's cooler. So um, it, it has a role in things like immune support, but the big thing is it really supports hormone production. Um, unfortunately, some of the reference ranges, depending on the lab that you use, they can show that anywhere from 30 to 100 is normal. That's a big range. Ideally, you want to be in the 50s and 60s, maybe even the 70s. And um, we get asked a lot about like, what, how much should I be taking? It depends on two factors where you currently are. So importance of getting blood drawn. Ideally, I would say twice a year in the cooler months and the, the summer months. So you can adjust that accordingly. But the vitamin D council recommends somewhere in the realm of a thousand IUs per 25 pounds of body weight. So someone who's a hundred pounds, just to keep the math, you know, easy, it's going to be about 4,000 IUs. Um, I, I prefer using like a liquid based one where you can just drop it under the tongue. Um, one that we use, it's a thousand per drop. So you can use it on your kids, on yourself. It's easier to manage. You just want to make sure you take that with a fat based meal or food. I mean, it could just be eggs, you know, in the morning, it could be um, avocado toast, it could be, you know, hummus, you know, anything with like a healthy fat, it will aid in the absorption, you don't want to take it on an empty stomach. Um, balancing your omega threes and sixes. So we know the importance of omega threes and just omegas in general act as natural anti has has a natural anti inflammatory effect on the body. And, you know, when we talk about chronic diseases, inflammation is one of these things that constantly comes up. So as far as examples of omega-3s, wild-caught fish, flaxseed, chia seeds, walnuts, grass-fed animal products, those are ideal. And our ancestors, you know, they experienced a one-to-one -one ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s. And now, you know, most Americans were having our ratios are so off. It's like 20 to one. And this just accelerates chronic disease and inflammatory processes. So it's important to steer clear from omega three or excuse me, omega sixes, especially these following oils, corn oil, soft flour, sunflower, cottonseed, canola, soybean, and peanut. But there is a class of omega-6s that you may want to incorporate as studies have shown to support healthy progesterone levels. And it's called GLA. It's typically found in evening primrose oil, which is more in a supplement form, borage oil, as well as hemp seeds. So here, um, one of the things that I, so it's, Part of what's in my tea is like adaptogenic herbs. They tend to promote balance and protect the body from a wide variety of diseases. So in addition to combating things like stress and boosting immune function, research has shown that ashwagandha and holy basil, also known as Tulsi, enhances hormone imbalance, excuse me, hormone balance by improving thyroid function, supporting adrenal glands, stabilizing blood sugar, reducing anxiety and depression and reducing brain cell degeneration, which is super important because as I mentioned before, um, if we're tapped out and cortisol and estrogen, they're fighting for receptors, cortisol is going to win and it's, it's gonna brain cell degeneration. There you go. Um, next, I just wanted to point out um, the importance of eating a variety of short, medium, and long chain fatty acids. They're key to keeping hormones in check and essential for their production and speeding up your metabolism. So these are gonna be things like your coconut oil, your avocados, um, what else is there? Those are gonna be the main two. Wild caught salmon is another good one. Um, grass fed butter, those types of things, they're gonna be great for that. Uh, caffeine, okay, so before anyone shoots me, um, <laughs> I'm not gonna say like completely eliminate it, but if you are very symptomatic, this is one of the, the easiest, I won't say the easiest, the quickest things that you can do to um, help support 
better cortisol levels. Cortisol is secreted by the adrenal glands. They're known as your stress hormones. And what caffeine will do, it will elevate cortisol. Cortisol in turn will elevate insulin. And when we start feeling like weight gain is around the corner, it's because insulin is a fat storage hormone. So indirect, I'm not saying that caffeine makes us gain weight, but I'm saying there's many factors. If you're gonna do any kind of caffeine, limit it to the morning. Um, and preferably if you are into trying to make a switch, matcha green tea, that Tulsi tea, one to two cups of those max per day is great. But if you're like, no, coffee is my love language, I am not divorcing that, then I would encourage you to switch to decaf, but not regular decaf as that contains a lot of chemicals. There's something called Swiss water processed coffee. You can find it at Trader Joe's. You can find it online. Um, so they have a special process so they don't have to add chemicals. They use water to extract the caffeine, but you still have that great taste. Because for many of our practice members, they're just like, I just love the taste. I just love how it makes me feel. It's so warm. I'm like, okay, well then maybe we can make a little switcheroo and just cut out the caffeine portion. Um, next up is the importance of our gut health. Um, so much gets synthesized and absorbed through our gut. So if we have leaky gut, it's important to really rectify that because it not only affects our digestive tract, but also causes hormonal issues, specifically targeting the thyroid. So even getting probiotic rich foods, like fermented vegetables, like sauerkraut, um, getting in some bone broth in there, some, I always say kefir, but I was corrected. It's kefir or kefir. I think that's how you say it. Um, so it's basically like, um, like a drinkable yogurt. Uh, sprouted seeds are also good. Some supplements that can be handy are digestive enzymes and probiotics. They aid in repairing your gut lining, which in turn can help balance hormones. And I'd be remiss if I didn't at least talk about body care products, kitchen products that we're using. So, I mean, compared to men, women are the product junkies. We have <laughs> like millions of bottles of lotion. We have the shampoos, we have all the things, the serums, so on, anti-aging anti things, all of those. So I would caution you and not to say you have to throw everything out, but I would at least take a look at what you're using or what you're using most commonly, because that may be the first thing you might want to make a switch. But ingredients like propylene glycol, parabens, phthalates, sodium laurel sulfate, just to name a few. These are ones that are big time hormone disruptors. They can actually act like hormones in the body. They're called xenoestrogens. Some of them are. So um, it can create inflammation, toxicity, and so on. Um, if you have not heard of the Environmental Working Group, they have a website, an app, and they have something called the Skin Deep Database. And they look at thousands of products that they have evaluated and ranked in order of not goodness. So I would encourage you to check that out. It has everything from sunscreens to like makeup and all kinds of good stuff. So that's a great resource. Also, the use of plastic bottles um, that can be replaced with glass and stainless steel because Plastic in general is not great for us, but many of them contain BPAs, which are a known hormone disruptor and estrogen mimicker. And then when it comes to our cookware, because hopefully we're, we're cooking a lot at home, um, switching from Teflon pans to stainless steel, ceramic or cast iron, it can, it can make a very big difference to our hormonal health as well. Um, and the little bit that I'll say about exercise, because Carrie's going to take over as this is her wheelhouse, but interval exercise, just, it really opens the hormone faucet to release the right amount of hormone at the right time in which your body needs. So things like burst training, even if it's just a few days a week, um, 20 minutes, often that's all that we need. But Carrie's going to get into, you know, how things like exercise changes and more info on that. Okay. That was so much good information. I'm making a note of that Swiss, what is it called? Swiss water? 
coffee Listener process. Yep. Okay, perfect. I'm going to be checking that out. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Michelle. That was a wealth of information. And I'm going to give you just a few tips about exercise. Um, ladies, the way you exercised in your 20s and 30s is not the same way you're going to be exercising in your 40s, 50s, and 60s. And before I even tell you the two most important types of exercise to be sprinkling in, I want to talk to you about the conversation you're having in your brain when you're exercising. Because if your internal dialogue is, I hate this, I will never be good at this. I loathe this. I can't wait till it's over. I'm miserable. Your body is registering that exercise as a stressful event. As we've talked about, that means your body will be releasing cortisol. And as we've talked about, we know cortisol can contribute to belly fat. So the very exercise you're doing could be having the wrong effect. Instead, your internal conversation should be, this is hard, but I love this. I feel good. I can't wait till how I feel afterwards. I am not miserable. And there's way too many forms of exercise out there to choose something that you hate. So play around with exercise and think about, you know, what might bring you some joy and happiness in your exercise routine. Like Dr. Michelle mentioned, there's two forms of exercise that have been shown in midlife women to be the best. And the first is high intensity interval training. It does not have to be hours long. It could be 20 minutes long. And that usually means there's a period of work, usually lasting from 40 seconds to a minute, followed by a variable rest period. So I, for example, love Tabata. I think I, I just do a free one on YouTube. Um, and it gives me 40 seconds of exercise and then maybe a 20 second rest before the next cycle starts. I get it done in 24 minutes. Um, at 5.30 in the morning before everyone starts getting up in the house. And I really look forward to it, but I had to test out a couple different versions until I found one that I really liked. So um, that's the first thing. And the high intensity interval training, it increases your metabolic control, decreases cell death and boosts your brain health. So fantastic benefits. I also follow the exercise physiologist, Stacy Sims, and her slogan is, midlife is the time to start lifting heavy shit. And so we really do need to incorporate resistance training to counteract the effects of that muscle cell death, but also the effects on our bones. So the bones will benefit from both multi-directional high intensity intervals, but also from resistance training. Now, if you have not been a weightlifter, you cannot start from ground zero and start bench pressing and back squatting and deadlifting. You have to start very slow by just using your body weight and getting your form down. And then you should incorporate some light resistance, like light weights or resistance bands. And then I highly recommend, even if you only see a trainer for one or two visits, if you're going to get into the heavier weightlifting, I want your form to be impeccable so that we don't create any unnecessary injury. When we're 10 and we roll our ankle, we bounce up and we're fine. When we're 50 and we roll our ankle, we're nursing that sucker for six months. So we really want to do everything we can to make sure we're moving with mechanics. As women, you have two areas of vulnerability when you exercise. The first is the connective tissue between your two six-pack muscles, which might make you predisposed to something we call diastasis rectus abdominis or a separation of your six-pack muscles. And also your pelvic floor regions are a little bit more vulnerable. Why are they vulnerable? Because you're losing estrogen which makes those muscles a little bit more atrophy, makes your vagina a little bit um, shorter vault of the vagina. Things are changing down there. And so the last thing we want to do is add a lot of impact to an area that isn't ready to accept it. So this is a shameless plug for my DRA Core Restore online program. It's a six-week program. It is honestly the most responsible thing that you can do for your body before you start doing a major exercise program. And that will be, I guess I just gave it away. That will be my giveaway at the end of this program. Now for pelvic health, what can you do about those genitourinary syndromes of menopause? This is my favorite topic. This is my bread and butter. This is what I've based my career on. So you need to get very good about your vulvar care in midlife. Now, before I go there, I'm just going to say a quick thing related back to the sleep that you were talking about, Dr. Michelle. Sleep is important, but I follow the sex therapist, Esther Perel, and she talks about, promise this will relate back to our topic. I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but she talks about foreplay 
And she says, foreplay is not what you do five minutes before the deed. Foreplay starts at the last orgasm. Foreplay is the flirty text you send. It's the compliments. It's the, how can I make your life better? That leads to the sex. And I want you to think about sleep the same way. Sleep is not something that you start thinking about five minutes before your head hits the pillow. You start preparing for a good night's sleep from the minute your eyes pop open in the morning with doing things like Dr. Michelle mentioned about the caffeine and whatnot. Sorry, I talk about pelvic health and sex gets on my mind and then I think of all these little parallels. Okay, back to pelvic health. You need to get really good about your vulvar care. Your vagina is a self-cleaning oven. It does not need chemicals. It does not need douches. It does not need any of those products that are trying to sell us. If you go to the period product aisle, you will see a whole category of products designed to make you feel like your vagina is stinky and should smell like cucumber melon or lavender or vanilla. Vaginas do not smell like any of these things. A vagina should smell like a vagina. Vaginas can smell yeasty, almost like fresh baked bread. There can be like a tiny weed-like fragrance. It can even smell a little fishy and still be normal. But if there is a very putrid smell, this isn't something we're trying to cover up. That's our body signal to us that something is amiss. You have a delicate ecology of bacteria growing like a garden inside your vagina that we should not be disturbing. So when you wash warm water in a soap that doesn't have any of those harmful ingredients that Dr. Michelle mentioned, so something very mild, you're washing pubic hair if you have it, and you're washing the skin around the vulva, but you're not separating the labia and getting on th uh, there and trying to really scrub things out. Your body will take care of it for you. You want to make sure that you're laundering your undergarments with a free and clear detergent of some sort. 100% white organic cotton is the best thing to touch your crotch. Now, that doesn't mean granny panties. We've seen really sexy underwear that has just the white crotch part. But you're thinking about if you're still menstruating, using more natural products for, your, for menstruating. Um, what else? Oh, for the dryness. So how do we handle vaginal dryness? Well, there's two, two things you can do. If your dryness is like a regular dryness that you feel just as you're walking around, your clothes are uncomfortable. It hurts to sit down. You're looking to choose a vaginal moisturizer. These products are designed to last for several days and you're choosing a moisturizer without those harmful ingredients. Um, I have a couple of favorites. I like, yes, vaginal moisturizer. Restore by Good Clean Love and Jelva, although you should maybe run it by your doctor because there might be a few hormones in that product, like a DHEA that you just might want to double check with. That's for moisturizers. If we're talking about specifically for penetration, vaginal penetration, that would happen with either sexual intercourse or solo self-pleasure. Um, you want to use a lubricant to help with some of the dryness. Now, lubricants can be broken down into three categories. There's water-based, oil-based, and silicone-based. Water-based lubricants are nice because they wash off easily and they're condom safe. The disadvantage is they have a lot of ingredients that can be harmful to your vulva. So check the ingredient labels and avoid some of those things Dr. Michelle mentioned. Silicone-based lubricants are my favorite. They dry to like a silky powdery finish. They're the most long lasting of any of them. The only con about using these is if you're using a silicone toy, some sort, you should not use a silicone lubricant with that. And then we have oil-based lubricants. So women are asking me all the time, can I just use a coconut oil or an olive oil from home? And a follow-up question needs to be, what is your method of birth control and STI prevention? Because if you're using condoms to prevent a pregnancy and ladies, until you're done with your 12 months of no period, you still have a pregnancy risk. If you're using condoms for pregnancy prevention or to prevent a sexually transmitted in infection, certain oils will break down the condoms. So that is a big deal. The other thing about oil is that it clings to the walls of the vagina, which could be good. Think about cooking with oil and you get it on your hands. You might have to like run it under warm water and use some soap to fully clean it out. So that could be good, but its blessing is also its curse because it's harder for your vagina to flush out oil-based lubricants. So if you're prone to yeast infections, urinary tract infections, bacterial vaginosis, you probably want to be a little bit more careful about using those types of products. And then uh, last I'll say is bladder habits. So there might be a little bit more leakage at this time of our life. Quick bladder facts. Your bladder can hold two cups of urine before it needs to be emptied. 
And an urge is merely a signal your bladder is feeling as it stretches to fill with urine, not a command to go to the toilet. The average range of peeing in a 24 hour period is six to eight times. Our bladder capacity will diminish as we age. So you might have to get up once at night to go to the bathroom, but we like to see that you're getting right back to sleep because we've talked about how important sleep is in midlife. So if you notice that you wake up, the hamster wheel starts turning and now you can't get back to sleep. We're gonna think about limiting your fluid intake for a couple of hours before you go to bed. The uh, intervals avoiding, you shouldn't have to go more than every two hours. Um, but of course that depends on medications you're taking and how much water you're drinking. And you shouldn't be waiting more than four hours. If you can hold four hours, that means you're not drinking near enough water and water is your bladder's best friend. First thing people do when they have a little bit of leakage is limit their water intake. And that's one of the worst decisions you can make because so much of what we eat and drink throughout the day is a known irritant to the lining of the bladder, including our friend coffee. So the more water we drink, the more diluted environment we create in the bladder so that there's less urgency and leakage issues. Um, worst thing women can do, besides not drinking enough water, is going just in case ever had any leakage, it's very tempting to say, gosh, I don't want that to happen again. I'm passing by a bathroom, just going to pop in just in case. But if you constantly beat your bladder to the punch, you don't let it stretch to fill that two cups of urine. You create a bratty bladder that then tells you, you have to go all the time. So if you're going on a four hour car trip, of course, go just in case we all would. But if you're popping out for a quick errand, you know, you've just gone to the bathroom. You haven't had loads of water to drink. I'd rather you try to stretch it out even if that means abandoning your cart in aisle three to use the bathroom, that would be better than constantly beating your bladder to the punch. Um, okay, so that's uh, that's all for my little section. And I think Dr. Michelle wanted to talk briefly about scanning and how that might help in midlife. Yep, I just wanted to bring up how you can leverage technology to help bridge the gap because there's that quote, you can't really know where you're going until you know where you've been. So how we use technology at our office is to be able to establish a baseline. We know that a woman's menstrual cycle and her whole reproductive system is under the direct influence of the nervous system. So that's the brain, the spinal cord, and all those nerves that exit off of the cord and feeds everything beyond the muscles. It's the organs, glands, tissues, all of it. So we know that... Um, if the body's in a state of stress, and we're not just talking about physical stress, um, we're talking chemical stress, we're talking mental emotional stress, it leaves its mark and it starts to create patterns. So the scans are able to, one, see if there's any stress that's stuck on to what degree um, and how your body's currently trying to adapt. So one of the one of the three scans that we do is called heart rate variability. So many of us who have maybe a smart watch or an aura ring, that's a more elementary version of tracking heart rate variability. And I like this because it'll show what kind of reserves you have. And if we are in full on fight or flight response, that is one of our red flags that we look for, because especially as we are transitioning into this different phase of life, um, we see it, I see it often with our with our wellness practice members is like how their scans looked from five, 10 years ago is going to be different now. And we expect things to shift and change. We're fine with the shifting and changing, but if we start to see that your body's not able to keep up with the demands that is being put on it, that's a problem. So we can kind of reverse engineer like, okay, what, what is the main goal? Is it sleeping through the night? Is it, um, is it energy? You know, what is it? And then we can look at some of the lifestyle things that are going on so that we have a game plan from one scan to the next to look for those changes. And sometimes it could be as simple of a tweak as eating a handful of nuts before bed, you know, or wearing one of those like cheapy, um, eye masks, you know, before bedtime to block out the light. So we're able to help troubleshoot there. So we have the heart rate variability, which I just talked about. It looks at those adaptability reserves um, with how you adapt to future stresses. We have thermography, which is looking at um, the autonomic functions. So everything going on in the background. And then we have a surface EMG, which is looking at how hard your body is working when you're at rest. So we do know that for many of us, 
we slow down, we may not exercise as much. So the last thing that we want to see is an impairment of how those muscles are activating, especially around our core. So if we're seeing less muscle activation, that's your body's having to overcompensate left and right. And we can feel like we're just more sore. And all we did was wake up for the day. That's, that's problematic. So we don't want that. Um, we want to make sure that the body doesn't stay stuck in that protective fight or flight state. So um, one of the things that we'll be giving away is a scan, but as well as some stress and adrenal support that has some of the yummy herbs and things that we talked about. Um, because Again, um, no one is perfect. We all have stuff going on. And the great thing about adrenal support and things similar to this is it helps to rebuild those glands from the inside out. It's not another Band-Aid. It's literally helping to support from the inside out. So we're not having to be dependent on things like caffeine and other things of that nature. So that's one thing I just wanted to point out when it comes to not guessing, you know, we can test for this stuff, but as far as specific hormonal levels, that's where you're going to want to get in touch with your gynecologist or functional medicine person, um, as they will be able to effectively track that. Whereas we can look at big picture foundational things, making sure that that brain is effectively communicating with every other part of your body. That's great. I'll do a quick wrap up. I know we're approaching the time and we want to respect all of your time. While I'm doing that, Dr. Michelle, there was a question about vitamin D3 in the chat. If you want to answer that, um, I just want to say that um, menopause might represent the end of something. And I think we need to have a moment to honor what's not coming with us into the next phase of our life. Um, fertility, we're leaving behind menstrual products. Uh, we're leaving behind familiar rhythms maybe even a desire to please those around us. Not all of these bad things, but what is happening and what we're gaining is a new stream of consciousness. We're starting to think less with the logical side of our brain and more heart part of our brain. We might not find the words for what we want to say all of the time, but what we say is loaded with the intentionality of what we really mean this phase of our life. We are unapologetically leaving behind the mental and emotional baggage that has been weighing us down so that we can enter the second half of our life with a lighter load. And we are maybe for the first time mothering ourselves and showering ourselves with the unconditional kindness that we once reserved only for other people. So hopefully you can listen to the messages in the mess that might be your perimenopause journey and make some of these health changes that Dr. Michelle and I talked about so that you're entering the second phase of life a little healthier. So I think I'll go ahead and quick do um, my little giveaway. That's okay with you, Dr. Michelle. Yep, I'm just gonna stop the recording once I find